Hey guys, welcome back to Cold Blood Creations. In this video, we're going to be talking general care and maintenance of blood pythons. So, on November of the year 2007, the blood python made its debut on the cover of Reptile Magazine. Now, since this article by David and Tracy Barker came out, the blood pythons have become increasingly popular in the pet trade, and rightfully so. They're a magnificently beautiful animal, and they have a great size that makes them a good pet. Now, unlike the ball pythons, their smaller cousins that we affectionately refer to as the pet rocks, these guys have a little more size on them, and they're a little more suitable for someone who wants a large snake without getting into the giant size of its larger cousins, the Burmese and the reticulated pythons. The blood python is a medium-sized snake, big enough to be impressive, but small enough to be handleable by even young children. So many people consider the blood python to be an angry or a uh, hostile animal. And that reputation is not entirely undeserved. You see, when the blood pythons first entered the United States, they came in because of the skin trade. People would collect these large pythons for the leather industry, and those snakes were often roughly handled, and they were large adult snakes that had been... Uh, spent their entire life in the wild, never having been exposed to being around humans, certainly humans that were going to skin them out for leather. Now, it was a uh, fact that because of the secret nature of the blood python, very, very few young hatchlings saw their way into the United States through the importation of the blood pythons. Um, as a result, we got these large adults that were nervous, they were aggressive, and many people viewed the blood python to be just that, an irrational, completely angry, hostile, and dangerous reptile. However, captive-born animals can and do settle down in captivity. Now, blood pythons, when they first come out of the egg and they're little, they are a little bit nippy. Um, as you can see here, these little guys have a very, very fast strike. In fact, they almost remind me of the Gaboon Vipers. They're a large-bodied snake that has an amazing lightning-fast strike, something you want to consider being careful of when you're working with your smaller uh, baby snakes that have not quite got over the nervousness of being around humans yet. So you've come home from the reptile shop and or the reptile expo and you've got your new baby blood python. We're going to walk you through the setup, help you get this animal off to a good start and show you some tips and tricks that we use here at Cold Blood Creations to rear these animals up to adulthood. So there's several cages on the market right now for reptiles and some of them are more suitable than others when it comes to blood pythons. One thing to consider is that bloods like high humidity. Now unlike the desert kings and the California kings in our last video, blood pythons are not a desert species. In fact, the humidity level in your blood python cage should be somewhere around 80%. There are some cages that make that difficult, although not impossible, such as this aquarium right here. Now, while we do recommend these type of cages because the screens slide open and close, one of the problems with the screen top is that it causes the humidity to escape out of the screen on the top. Now, one thing that you can do to, uh, to take care of that is to partially cover the top of the cage you can use a towel, you can use a piece of wood, a piece of glass, uh, you can even use ceramic tiles, something that will allow the humidity to stay in the cage and not evaporate through the screen top. So one other thing that you can use, um, if I didn't mention it previously, if you want to put something on the top of your cage, um, a piece of tile like this, just lay across the top. You can put a couple of pieces. Now, you don't want to completely cover the top because you need some airflow. So what I would do is try to cover the middle part of the cage, leave a little bit of opening on each end. That way some airflow can kind of pour through your cage. Now, one thing that I hate to see people use, and there's a lot of people that do this. I absolutely uh, just abhor seeing it is a lot of people will set a light like this on top of a cage and they'll heat their cage in this way. Now, one of the reasons why I'm very much against this is because if you have a pet, uh, like a cat or a young child, 
they could knock this thing over on the floor and if you've got a really hot bulb there it creates a fire hazard for your family so think fire prevention think safety the best way to heat a snake cage is from the bottom um, and we do that with a heating pad a stick on heating pad like this one here now what you want to do is to use utilize your heat pad on one end of the cage or the other you don't want to put it right in the middle and heat the entire cage you want to put it on one side or the other that allows a heat gradient through the cage you have a warm side a median side and then a cooler side place your water bowls kind of more in the middle because you want some water evaporation that will also help to keep the humidity level up. Now on our video on king snakes on desert kings we recommended the water bowl be on the cool side but because of the humidity issue we want you to put your water bowl a little bit closer to the warm side. The other reason is because blood pythons absolutely love to bathe so don't be surprised if you find your blood pythons laying in the water frequently. So place your heat pad on the bottom of the cage, like so. Plug it in, keep them warm, keep them humid. Another thing I want to mention is to make sure that you have a good secure top for your cage. One that slides. The aquariums that come for fish that have the screen top that just sits down, you're never going to keep a, a, a blood python in that cage. They will push that up. No matter how many books, no matter how many weights you stack on top of it, eventually your snake will escape. Make sure you got a good sliding top. Now, when we talk about water, I mentioned earlier that blood pythons like to soak. So you want to make sure that you get a water bowl or a water tub big enough that the python can actually get its whole body in and submerge itself in the water. Something that's readily available and that can be used are these Rubbermaid shoe boxes or Sterilite shoe boxes. Get a couple of these and I say the reason you want to get two is because sometimes they will defecate in their water bowl and when you take this out to clean it you can go ahead and put the clean one back in until you get the other one washed up. So we want to put this inside and we will put just a little bit of water in here now, as far as the bedding goes, there's a couple of things to consider. Once again, one of those being the humidity. You want a bedding layer that will hold humidity. A couple of things that we like to use is this peat moss, uh, sphagnum moss mixture with soil. We kind of mix the peat moss and the soil together. If you want a more natural looking cage, uh, you can also use cypress mulch. Never use cedar. Write this down, never ever use cedar. Cedar is toxic and it will kill your blood python. Um, but you can use cypress mulch. You can also use newspaper, craft paper, paper towels, uh, even an old uh, towel, beets towel. But remember that they are going to defecate on anything that you use. The plus side of using newspaper or craft paper is that visually you can see immediately when the snake soils it. It's cheap, it's readily available, you can take it out and clean it. The downsize to it is that it doesn't hold humidity as well as like a soil like this. Now, the other thing I want to consider about blood pythons is that they are a very secretive animal, especially when they're young. And for that reason, a hide box is an absolute must. So one of the things that we recommend is some sort of hide box. Now, this could be a wide variety of things. It could be something commercially available like this cave right here. What we like to do is put this over the heat pad. That way the animal can crawl in. He's laying over the heat pad. He can warm himself up in the security of this dark cave and he can hide himself. He's warm, he's secure, and he'll be much more uh, likely to not quite be as irrational when you're going to pick them up. The other thing, if you're using glass tanks like this, we do recommend that you either paint or put some kind of a backing on, the, on at least the back. Preferably, if you're gonna paint it, come around all three sides and only leave the front open. That'll help your animal feel a little more secure. So lastly, we wanna talk about temperature. Now, the blood pythons don't have to be kept quite as warm as balls and Burmese pythons. Um, our air temperature in our building where we house our blood pythons, our air temperature is about 75 degrees. That's the ambient air temperature. Now at 75 degrees, this animal is going to need an external heat source. That is why we recommend the heat pad. 
But if the animal cools itself down all the way on the other side, 75 degrees is perfectly fine. That's not too cool. You're not going to develop respiratory infections uh, at that temperature. Uh, as long as the snake can go back to the warm side and warm itself up. Now, I should mention that this is a 20 gallon size cage here, and this will house a blood python for probably the first year, maybe a little over a year, but as you feed the animal and they continue to grow, eventually you're gonna need something bigger. Now, one thing that we do recommend is that you don't go ahead and buy a huge cage in the very beginning. Blood pythons, much like ball pythons, tend to like to feed in the security of a smaller cage. In fact, whenever we feed our blood python hatchlings, we feed them in these little small tubs in a dark rack system. We find that they feed much more readily in a small space than they do in something very, very large. So we would recommend starting out with a 20 gallon maybe, uh, maybe even a 10, then finally move it up to the 40. As these snakes become full grown, of course, you're going to need to house them in something just a little bit larger than a 40 gallon tank. So when it comes to feeding, blood pythons are relatively easy to feed. These guys are voracious in their appetite at any size, whether they're hatchlings or full grown adults, feeding problems are very rare with bloods. Now, one question that we get asked often at reptile shows is, can I feed my young snake a cricket? Now, I'm not sure where this rumor started, but there are very, very few snakes out there that will actually feed on crickets. But rodents of various sizes are the staple diet of most all pythons in captivity. Now, the blood python, again, is no exception to that. One thing we would caution you about is to start with rats and stay with rats. One thing that people find is that mice and rats oftentimes smell different. And that smell sometimes can trigger a lack of a feeding response. If you start feeding your pythons mice in the very beginning when they're young, and they develop a preference for that, it can be a little difficult to switch them over to rats later on. A blood python fresh out of the egg has the ability to kill and eat or to eat a fuzzy rat. So there's no reason to have to start them off on mice. So for that reason, keep it simple, stick with rats, and then adjust the size of the prey as the animal increases in size. So now when we're talking about feeding, there's a couple of things I'm going to highly recommend to you. You guys have heard this before if you've watched some of our other videos, but feeding tongs. The reason is because pythons have heat pits in the front of their mouth. That means that they can sense temperature differences. Now, if you're using frozen thawed rodents, which many of you prefer, then you're probably gonna find out that if you offer a frozen thaw rodent with your hands, your body temperature is gonna be much warmer than the frozen thawed rodent. So when the snake strikes and bites into something, guess which one he's gonna prefer? The human body temperature or the frozen thawed rodent? Even at room temperature, that rodent's not gonna put up a heat signal quite as hot as you are. So you're gonna probably get yourself bit if you hold rodents in your hand and feed. For that reason, with young snakes, we recommend a pair of tongs like this. You just basically grab the mouse or, or rat, preferably, and hold it in front of the snake until he strikes it off of the tongs. That way you don't end up with bloody fingers from a hungry blood python. And when they're adults, we highly recommend feeding tongs. Adult blood pythons are capable of inflicting very bloody wounds. They don't call them blood pythons for nothing. You could wind up in an emergency room getting stitches from those sharp teeth. So we recommend if you're feeding rats, feed them with a pair of tongs like this. Keep your hands safe because even the most docile pet snake can miss the rodent and latch onto your hand if you're not careful. So last but not least, we want to talk about how accidents happen. Now there's a couple of different accidents that can happen with a blood python, one of which is escapes. Now if you follow our guidelines on cages, never use this type of top. This, type of top. this is a top for a fish aquarium, it sits on the top. And a lot of people would use this, they'll stack books on top of it. This is garbage. Don't use that for snakes. I promise you, you will have an escape. Make sure you have a cage door that latches, that locks, that slides in, that pins. Make sure the door is designed to keep snakes secure and you won't have an accidental escape. 
The other type of accident that usually happens is a bite. Now there's a couple of ways that you're going to get yourself bit. Number one way is if you open a hide box really, really quick, reach in, snatch your snake out, and you scare it, he's probably going to strike at you and bite you because you startled him. So always move around your snakes deliberately but cautiously. Don't make quick movements toward the head. They, they are programmed to see that as a predator coming toward them, and they will defend themselves. The other way that you get bit is if you smell like something your snake's going to eat. What I mean by that is if you're sitting on the couch watching television, petting your cat, and all of a sudden you walk over to your blood python, open the cage, and reach in your hand smelling like kitty cat, you're probably going to get nailed in a feeding response, which is oftentimes one of the most painful bites because the snake locks in, sets the teeth, and follows it up with constriction. Make sure if you're handling rabbits, rodents, kittens, puppies, anything that smells like warm-blooded hairy prey, you go wash your hands prior to handling your blood python. That way you're not mistaken for food. So in the beginning of the video, I promised you we were going to share some tips and tricks with you. Now I want to share with you just a little trick here that I have shared this with people at reptile shows that have come up to me and asked questions about their ball pythons and about shedding issues and feeding issues. We have a little something we call a thing. Now, basically, a thing does a lot of things. That's why we call it the thing. It's simply this. You guys probably recognize these. These are what Christmas cookies come in. So, at, during Christmas time, if you get one of these things, save it. These things will help you out quite a bit when it comes to housing and feeding your blood python. Now, basically, this is how it works. People tell us all the time, well, my ball python's not shedding during the winter time. The humidity's too low, and the same thing will happen with blood pythons. Sometimes they'll go off feed because they're nervous or they feel uh, insecure. Something that you can utilize is basically this. It's a plastic bowl that cookies come in. You cut a hole in the top of it like so. What you want to do for humidity purposes is just take some paper towels, just break off paper towels, Lay the paper towels inside the cage here. Take a spray bottle and just dampen down your paper towels. You don't want it slopping wet. You don't want water on the inside. You're not trying to create a water bowl. What you're trying to do is create damp paper towels. Put the top back on this and use this in place of your hide. Set it right underneath your heat pad. Now, this will do two things for your blood python. Number one, it will give him what is referred to as a humidity cave. The humidity cave sitting over this, the water will evaporate out of the paper towels. It can't completely escape this bowl because there's only a small hole where the snake enters and exits. Therefore, the inside of this will be very, very humid. The other thing is because it's dark, the snake will feel secure. When you go to feed your snake, sometimes you can feed them in this if you're having problems with them eating. A lot of times if you'll drop a pre-killed rodent into the thing, you'll find that your snake will eat it overnight. Okay guys, so we have another frequently asked question. So this week's question is, what's the difference between venomous and poisonous? Well, to answer that question, basically we have to look at what is the difference between a venom and a poison. Now, poisons are something that you ingest, something that you take into the body through your mouth. Uh, perhaps some of them could go through the eyes or the mucous membrane. However, venom are something that has to be injected, usually through the use of a fang. So there are no truly poisonous snakes. All snakes are venomous because they all inject their venom into you through the use of fangs, whether they're front fangs, uh, fixed like the coral snakes and the cobras, or whether they're rear fang like the mangroves or the hognose. So guys, we want to take this time to say thank you so much to those of you guys who have contacted us. We so far have had the best year yet in terms of online sales, uh, sales at reptile shows, and we want to just say thank you to all our friends, family, and our customers. Uh, without you guys, there certainly would be no Cold Blood Creations. We also want to thank you guys for over 1,300 subscribers here on YouTube. And if you like this video, make sure you give it a thumbs up and subscribe down below, and we'll be seeing you guys in our next video. Thanks, Bye. guys. Bye-bye. Now, last but not least, we want to talk about accidents and how they happen. 
Did I say last but not least? I <laughs> think so. Hey guys, welcome back to Cold Blood Creations. This, uh, uh, sorry, I almost said this. Now, many compete. Many, many, many people. <laughs> you ever met them? 